doesn't that make you want to jump up and sing? Amen. Yeah, I wanted to sing with them there. Thank you, men. Take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 19, please. We're in Luke chapter 19 this morning. There's a lot going on around our country, isn't there? A lot going on around the world, too, as a matter of fact. And there's a lot of talk about the end times, and I do believe the talk is legitimate. I believe we are seeing the prophecy unfold before our eyes as preparation is being made for a one world government. Go, government how's that? A one world government. And. Uh, the next big event is the rapture of the church. And I say, even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Can you say amen to that? Amen. amen. Now, we don't know when that's going to take place. No man knows the day nor the hour. You know, it could happen this year. It could be a few years down the road. We don't know. The Bible doesn't give us uh, specifics uh, enough to be able to know that. But this morning, in light of those events and in light of that thinking and the light, in light of the fact that there's a whole lot of talk about that, I was asking the Lord, Lord, what do we do this morning as we look into your word? I want it to be applicable to where we're at right now. And the Lord brought me to this parable. And I want us to focus on this this morning because this gives us a little bit of direction in regards to what we do. In the midst of this mixed up world, waiting for the Lord to return. So beginning in verse number 11 of Luke 19, it says this. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable. Now this is Jesus speaking. <clears throat> because he was nigh to Jerusalem. And because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. Our Father in heaven, we ask that as we look in this passage, you will open our eyes to the truths that you have for us here. Dear Lord, it's easy to get distracted by the things that are going on around us because they're so prominent and they do affect our lives in such a big way. But Lord, in this particular passage, as well as others that would be companion passages to this, you make it very plain, Lord, what our task is to be on this earth. May we not be distracted from it. And Lord, we pray this morning that you would teach us truths, that you would embed them within our hearts, and that your Holy Spirit will have the freedom Lord, to work those out in our lives and to apply them in all that we do, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I've stopped at that point in the parable on purpose. We'll come back and finish the rest of the parable, uh, reading it in just a few moments. But I want us to go back to verse number 11. And it, it tells us in verse number 11 why Jesus spoke the parable. Why is that? He gives us a couple reasons here. He says, because... He was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. And so he gives us the reason right there, why he spoke the parable. Because they thought, and who are the they here? That's the, uh, the, his apostles. They thought that the kingdom of God was going to immediately appear. You see, they were drawing nigh to Jerusalem in this passage. They're walking, they're traveling, they're getting close to Jerusalem. They knew that Jesus was the Messiah. By the way, Jesus is still the Messiah, right? He is the Messiah. They knew that. And that Messiah, they knew, also knew that the Messiah was to establish his kingdom and reign from the throne of David, which was in Jerusalem. So all these things they were already convinced of. 
So here was the Messiah. Here was the city of David. Jesus was at a very popular point in his ministry at this point. People were following him, listening to him preach. And so here's the Messiah. Here's the, uh, uh, the, the city of Jerusalem. The Messiah is uh, popular at this point. And so here's the opportunity to get the kingdom started. And so they see that and they say, here we are. And Jesus had to redirect their thinking. And I want you to think with me about that for just a moment. Aren't there times where Jesus brings things into our lives to help redirect our thinking? You see, they were ready to bypass the task at hand, and they were ready to focus on the coming kingdom. So Jesus gave them a parable to get their focus on the right thing. And let me say that I feel with all that is going on around us, the coronavirus and all of the uh, circumstances that surround that, the social unrest that we're seeing in our country right now, we can get easily distracted today, can we not? Amen. I mean, let's, let's not forget that God has given us a task to do. Let's not get, get, get so consumed with all that is going on around us that we forget the task that is at hand. You see, in verse number 12, it says that a nobleman took a certain journey. Now, this nobleman, of course, is Jesus Christ. He is uh, giving us uh, an illustration here through this parable of what was going to happen to him. Uh, and in just a few minutes, we're going to turn over to Acts chapter 1 and see this parable actually fleshed out. But here, here's what's going on. This nobleman represents Jesus Christ. There is a promise that he's going to leave and a promise that he's going to return. And there is a promise that he will receive a kingdom. And that describes, of course, the ultimate millennial kingdom that Jesus will have control over. And our purpose this morning is not to get into all the uh, prophetic aspect of it, but to focus on what God has given us to do now. So in this parable, the nobleman calls his servants together. He gives them an equal number of pounds. So look at verse number 13. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. So they each receive a pound. Ten servants, ten pounds. Each one gets a pound. Now the servants obviously represent God's children on earth. That would be you and me. All of us in this room and any that would claim to know Christ as their Savior. So obviously from this passage there is accountability on our part as God's children. There's an accountability for that pound that has been given to us. They are held accountable when Christ returns. Now, without turning there, do you remember the parable in Matthew 25? As I begin to explain it to you, you will remember it. In Matthew 25, there's a similar parable represented by a king who gives his servants talents. In that passage, they're called talents. In this passage, they're called pounds. And he gives each one a different one. If you remember, in Matthew 25, the parable says that he gave one ten talents, one five talents, and he gave one one talent. Now, those talents represented the various gifts that God has given to us. Some people have more talents uh, than others, and uh, our own experience bears that out as we see that in the lives of people around us. That's what the parable of Matthew 25 represents. But here in this parable, everyone receives the same. You see, these pounds don't represent the very talents that we have. These uh, pounds that are given to us right here represents the opportunity that is given to us in our lives to invest in God's work, which we all have. We may vary in our talents, but we all have opportunities that are given to us. We all have a life that has been given to us by God, and we're a steward of that life, and our responsibility is to take that life and to invest it in God's work. So these two parables represent different areas of responsibilities that we have. But in both, in both parables, we become stewards of what really belongs to the master. You see, it is his possession. And he's given us the responsibility of min, uh, ministering or managing the possession that belongs to him. Look at verse 16. Then came the first, this is the first sermon, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. There's a recognition here. 
a recognition that the pound belongs to the Lord, the nobleman. This life we live belongs to the Lord, does it not? We are simply stewards of it. Our life, the very air that we breathe, belongs to God. God has given us life, and because of that, he, um, he will one day hold us accountable for this life that we've lived. We oftentimes think that the talents, the abilities, and even the opportunities that come before us are our own to use upon uh, ourselves and to bring pleasure to ourselves or comfort to ourselves, when in reality, all of these things belong to God, and we are to be stewards. And one day, we will stand before God. But here's the point of the parable, verse number 13, the very last phrase. He said unto them, occupy till I come. There's the whole point of the parable. Occupy till I come. Do you realize this is the only thing that this nobleman says to these servants? At least what we have recorded here. It's the only thing he says to them before he left. Occupy till I come. You see, this is a command. Occupy. He says, I've provided you with the resources. Now use it. You see, this word occupy has to do with having a business matter that has to be taken care of. This is not uh, just a, uh, a, a loosely used word. There is a responsibility. We're not saved to sit. We're saved to be about the king's business. We are to be occupying we have the resources. He's given us the opportunity. He's given us life and breath. And uh, by giving us those things, we are to occupy until he returns. Now go with me to Acts chapter 1. And I want us to see, in Acts chapter 1, we're going to begin reading in verse number 6. Acts 1, verse number 6. And those that have been around Brentwood for any amount of time will not be surprised at what I'm about to say because... We've pointed these verses out before. I believe they're very applicable for any time, but right now I believe they're even more applicable considering what we're seeing around us and the fascination with prophecy in the end time. In Acts chapter 1 and beginning in verse number 6, of course, Jesus is there and he's about to be taken up into heaven. And it says, when they therefore were come together, that's the apostles again, they asked of him saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time Restore again the kingdom to Israel. Now wait just a minute. That was almost what they said in Luke 19, right? That's almost the exact same question, the exact same words. It was the same concept. Lord, are you, now that we've gone through the cross, now that you've resurrected, are you going to restore the kingdom now? You can tell where their mind was. And this is not a bad thing. They wanted the kingdom to be set up. I don't know about you. I'm looking forward to that. I'm tired of this world. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. I would sing it for you, but allergies got my throat a little raspy, so we'll just sing. Well, you're going you're to restore the kingdom again, Jesus? Verse 7. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. We don't know. It's really interesting to hear what Jesus is communicating. Look at verse number 8. But, but, see, the Father has the power to know the times and the seasons, but you shall receive power. I'm going to give you men power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Okay, Jesus, what are we going to do with that power? Then are we going to know the times and, uh, and the seasons? He says, and you shall be, you see the next word? Witnesses. Witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem. And all Judean and Samaria and under the othermost part of the earth. Jesus is basically saying here, men, listen, don't occupy your time wondering about the times and the seasons. That's within the Father's power. I'm going to give you power, but I'm going to give you power for this purpose. I want you to have power to be witnesses. Power to be witnesses. Go back with me to Luke 19. The passage in Acts 1, the parables lived out. There's a tendency to get occupied with the events around them and to forget the task that God has given them. 
And as a matter of fact, Jesus Christ has pointed this out to them, not just throughout his earthly ministry, but right before he leaves in Acts chapter 1, there seems to be every so often throughout the Gospels, Jesus Christ has to redirect their thinking. And I think there's a lesson for us to learn here. Because sometimes we can get so distracted with what's going on around us that we forget we have a task, right? We have the power of the Holy Spirit. He is indwelling us. And by the way, if you're here this morning and you have never accepted Christ as your personal Savior, you don't have that Holy Spirit indwelling within you. You would not understand what I'm talking about. But we can take care of that problem today. If you would like to come to Jesus Christ, we have plenty of folks around here that can take God's Word and can show you how you can know that your sins are forgiven and that you're on your way to heaven. And you can leave here with the indwelling Holy Spirit empowering you to be a witness for Jesus every day. But that Holy Spirit has empowered us so that we can be witnesses. That's our task. I'm reminded of a couple passages in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 says, For ye are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Paul writes to Titus and says, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto him a peculiar people zealous of good works. There's quite a few action verbs in those two verses. It says we were created, we were ordained, we were redeemed, and we were purified. And he gives us one of the reasons why all those things took place so that we could be zealous of good works. It is God's desire while we're on this earth to be a living testimony and a witness for him. That's our task. Don't be distracted looking for the kingdom. And if you don't get any details of this parable this morning as I preach this message, please walk away with this one main point. You have a task, and that task is to occupy, be about the Lord's business until he comes. God has given us all life, but he's not given us just life. He's given us eternal life. And with that life comes opportunity, and with those opportunities come responsibility. Use it for him. Look at verse number 14, please, as we continue to work through this passage. They say this. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Uh, these are not his servants. These citizens represent the unsaved people of the earth. And by the way, this is the earth that belongs to him that we occupy. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. This is his earth. He has a right to rule and reign. He has a right to dictate morality. He has a right to have expectations of his creation. And here these are part of his citizens. These are the unsaved people of the earth that are resisting his directives. Again, I'm reminded of a couple passages of scripture. John chapter 1 says, This was the true light, speaking of Jesus, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. In Psalm 2, a psalm that has come to my mind multiple times over the past couple months. Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. You see, those who reject Christ consider his word to be bands and cords that restrict them from the sin that they want to indulge in. Now, let me take a little tangent here for just a moment. Let me say this. All the injustice that we're seeing in our country. And I imagine we could stay here for the next couple hours and begin to list all the injustices that we've seen even within the, this, the, the, the year 2020 so far. All the injustices that we see in our country and around the world will never be resolved while we're on this earth. And that doesn't mean they don't make us mad. It doesn't mean that we don't want to see them resolved. That doesn't mean that there should be justice. I understand all that. It upsets me and we want to see justice. But draw comfort from this Christian. God's word says this in the book of Ecclesiastes. It says, if thou seest the oppression of the poor and violent perverting of judgment and justice in a province, marvel not at the matter. For he that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there be higher 
in vain. You see, if human government lets you down, God takes note. And one day he will set all things straight. Can you say amen to that? Amen. amen to that. God knows the score. He knows what's truth. And one day he will, he will set everything straight. Well, then we have verses 15 and 16. We're back in Luke now. I want you to notice it says, And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, that he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might make that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained 10 pounds. You see the analogy here uses money, but in order to gain the additional 10 pounds, there had to be an investment, right? In order to gain the additional 10 pounds, there had to be an investment. Now let me make some spiritual application. When opportunities arise, there will be nothing gained unless investment is made. Now we're making spiritual application. We're using finances as an application or as a, um, uh, an analogy. We can talk about the need for investment. And some people are good about that. We can talk about the many opportunities that in, exist for investment. We can even talk about the soon return of the king and the time for investment will soon be over. We can talk about all those things, but unless we take those opportunities and actually invest in God's work, there will be nothing gained. When we stand before God, which one of these servants do you want to be? Now let me bring this into perspective and we're just going to get down where the rubber meets the road for just a moment, all right? During the shelter in place that has taken place here in this state for the last 10 weeks and around the country for various lengths, but here in our own homes, let's say, we were told not to meet as a church. Now, what opportunities did you take during that time to be about the Lord's work? Did you pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ? We sent out a list of names of people at that time that attend this church sent it out to y'all our missionaries are listed on there we asked you to pray for them asked you to print it and pray did you take time to pray for them regularly did you call did you text did you email one of your church family members and encourage them in the lord you see god calls us a body right are y'all with me god calls us a body let me ask you this. Did you talk to anyone about the Lord? Or was all your conversations about the events that were going on around us? Did you get wrapped up in media? And all the things that the media is saying. And allow that to consume your mind. So, so much so that you could not even see opportunities that may have been open before you. Folks, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. We need to have an evaluation here. And I'm preaching to myself as much as I'm preaching to anybody in this room. You see, I, I don't Facebook. I don't have time for that. But I imagine a lot of folks who say that they are servants of the Lord spent over the last couple months more time talking about the virus than talking about the opportunities to minister to people. I imagine there was more talk about the virus and all the circumstances that were going on around it than to take the opportunity to tell people that there is an almighty God who can calm their fears. Well, I'm not saying that the virus isn't real and that it wasn't real at that time, but what I am saying is this. We as Christians have no need to be afraid. We take precautions, but then we have no need to fear because God uh, in, in, uh, God indwells us. God controls everything. And one of these days, we're going to stand in his presence, and he's the one that controls the timing. Amen. You know, the devil will use all kinds of tools to keep us from doing the Lord's business. We can say, oh, but I was so busy with other things. Or I was afraid I might 
get the virus or I have a good cause that I'm involved in and it just took so much time and you know what whatever the distraction will work the devil will use it so let me just take this a step further and let's say this because I honestly believe this with all of my heart this COVID-19 thing was a trial run to prepare us for the next time there's a crisis in our country now some of you that are conspiracy theorists are looking at this thinking what I mean by that is it's a trial run uh, for Big Brother to come in and, and tighten down the clamps even more that's not what I mean this time what I mean by that is this uh, God never throws us to the fire without preparing us God grows us one step at a time are you with me this morning all right I may mess up the camera shot but I'm gonna step over <laughs> here for a moment God never throws us to the fire without preparing us God leads us one step at a time and there's always preparation before there are bigger events that come in our lives and I believe what God has done here is I believe that God has allowed us to have a taste of what is coming uh, for this uh, well for churches period and I believe that this COVID-19 was a preparatory thing that God allowed so that we next time and there will be a next time there will be another crisis in this country there will be more controls that will be put in place but next time we have an opportunity to not focus on the distractions but focus on the task occupy till i come see what have we learned about the way we respond how did you do in the trial run this one was pretty mild, actually. We've not suffered any persecution. Yeah, you may have had a hard time finding toilet paper there for a little bit, but no real persecution. How did you do? I'm just telling you because, honestly, I'm looking and evaluating how I did. You see, right now, we may have a little relief for a short time, but the world is only going to get worse, Christian. You know how I know that? It's written in the book. It's not going to get any better. We're headed to a one world govern, government and it will be no friend to Christianity. And I honestly believe that this crisis that we're living through has revealed attitudes that we've had all along. It has not created attitudes. It has revealed attitudes that have not necessarily had the opportunity to express themselves. But what we've gone through over the last 10 weeks is actually revealing those. And I do believe that self-evaluation would be a good thing for all of us. How did we do? You see, during those times of crises, it's not a time for us to stay back and no longer be involved in the ministry of God. If that's your attitude, then you need to reread this passage. Because Jesus says, occupy till I come. During the time of crisis is when we need to be a better light and a better testimony for our Savior. It may be in a more creative way. It may be in a way that you've not thought of before. But it's not the time to stop talking about your Savior and start being distracted by other things that are around us. You know, Psalm 26, verse 2 says this, Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. Here is a psalmist, David, who is asking God to examine him, to prove him, to try him. And, the word, and in the verse right before that, he says, Judge me. And so the whole idea of this passage is David is saying, God, would you look at me from every angle? Purify me. Help me to see where I don't line up with your truth. And I just want to say to us, Christian, this may be a good time for us to do that. But look with me here at verse 17. Luke 19, verse 17. And he said unto him, Well done, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little. Have thou authority over ten cities. Here's the comforting thing, Christian. What is the criteria for being a good servant? <laughs> Faithfulness. Faithfulness. He gives it to us right here. You see, it's not so much the amount of money. As a matter of fact, Jesus calls it very little. Do you notice that? 
It was the faithfulness. And that should comfort us. That should comfort all of us. As we take the opportunities that God presents us, presents us with he will present us with more it's a growing process god never gives us more than we can handle but he grows us one step at a time now since i love to use my good church members as illustrations i'm going to use one this morning lynn bali has grown in the lord over the last few months just tremendously and he has expressed to me that he thought he would never be able to talk to someone about the Lord. But he has started taking little opportunities and talking to people about the Lord, giving them gospel tracts and saying, read through this. And if you have any questions, call, uh, call the church or whatever. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, watching him take those little steps was exciting. And now he is excited about God using him even in greater opportunities. And it's just kind of opened the door for him. And if you want to hear something exciting, just talk to him a little bit. See, God grows us in little steps. And he moves us forward. And the key is faithfulness. Many who do great service for the Lord are not greatly talented, but they're faithful. You see, you're not responsible for the results. That is left up to the Holy Spirit. Get that in your head. Your job is faithfulness, and that takes the pressure off of you and me. At the end of each sermon, I, would, I just want you to know my goal is to have delivered the message that God wanted for his people. The response to that message is out of my hands. That's between you and God. And if I can walk away with the clear conscience that I have delivered the very sermon that God wanted, I honestly believe that the word of God will do what God wants it to do in each heart that is surrendered. But that is up to you and him. If given the opportunity to present the gospel and you take that opportunity, remember your job is to present. It is the Holy Spirit's job to convince. You just need to be faithful. Well, that brings us to the last servant. Look at verse 20. And another came saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up. Uh, that thou layest not down and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he saith unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore thou gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have acquired mine own with usury. And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him that pound and give it to him that hath ten pounds. What did this servant do wrong? Did he misspend the master's pound? No, he didn't misspend it. He didn't use it at all. He didn't use it at all. The servant was convinced of his own excuse. He believed it when he came before the master, even though it was not the right answer. You see, and it just gives us a clear example that disobedience in one area can lead to deception. And if we disobey in one area of our lives, then we begin to make excuses and it literally leads us to be deceived within our own mind. And that leads to greater disobedience in other areas. And before long, we're excusing our disobedience. But this unfaithfulness is identified here as wickedness. Jesus said, wicked servant. Not to use the privilege of service is sin and it will result in loss you see the servant knew the right thing to do but the knowledge without the action did him no good the opportunity was lost now let me pause right here for just a moment and make a clarifying statement many christians view our christian life in relation to do's and don'ts and in a message like this uh, there are some people that will walk away with that, that it's, it's a matter of doing and doing and doing. But let me drive uh, home a point here. The real motivation in our service for our king is not a concept of do's and don'ts, but the fact that we love him. Amen. I'm not going to take time this morning to, uh, to, 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 to drive this point home, but there are plenty of passages of scripture that teach us that service begins with love. Jesus Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. A love for our Savior 
will cause us to want to please him and want to serve him, period. And as those opportunities come along, it may be uncomfortable at first, but we will love our Savior so much that we want to talk about him. Well, one last thing I want to point out. Look at verse 27. He says, but those mine enemies, <clears throat> which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. You know, you wonder, why did Jesus include that here? Because you would think that the main thrust of this parable is about the servants and the pounds and their accountabilities. And, and it is. But I think it goes right back to the very beginning of this parable where Jesus said, uh, as they got near to Jerusalem, let me tell you about this king that went away, occupy till I come. And I think the point that Jesus is making here by giving us verse number 27 is that when he returns, he will judge the wicked. That's his job, not our job, his job. He has given us our job. Occupy till I come. So let's be faithful and occupy and be about the kingdom business. Would you bow your head with me this morning? In just a moment, I'm going to ask Mrs. Askins to step to the piano and play a couple verses of invitation. And during that time, we're going to take some time just to pray right where we're at. But before I do, I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. And it may be that during this time of prayer, you need to ask the Lord to do an evaluation within your heart. And teach you to be faithful to the things that he has given you to do. It may be that you've gotten distracted and, and, and you know you have. And you've not taken the opportunities that lie before you every day because you have a life and that life belongs to God. Would you take care of those things this morning? Our Father in heaven, we do thank you for the truths of your word. Lord, we thank you for the example that's given. Father, we also thank you that you grow us step by step. Lord, it is a step-by-step -step process. And Lord, as we take that first step, you open the next door. And Lord, if we're faithful over a little, uh, you will make us faithful over more things. And Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I also thank you that um, the, uh, the criteria is faithfulness. Lord, that your Holy Spirit is the one that is responsible for convicting and convincing and drawing people to you. We just have to remain faithful and give the message and occupy so, Lord, would you teach us this truth? And, Father, we pray that over the next couple minutes, you would deal in the hearts of the individuals that are in this room. Father, we pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask Mrs. Haskins to play a verse of invitation. Would you simply just bow your head right where you're at and do some business with the Lord right now?
Thank you. All right, we're going to be dismissed here in order. Uh, let me remind us that we'll be back this evening at 6 for our evening service. Uh, the ushers will dismiss starting in this section here. Please don't uh, loiter around because um, we need to come in and uh, sanitize things. But at the same time, uh, we don't want to uh, be in two big groupings. Uh, I'll be back there to greet you all as you leave. Uh, please remain seated until uh, ushers come by uh, to dismiss you. And I'm going to ask Brother Carl DeOily, if he would, to stand, lead us in a word of prayer. Uh, is Joe back there? Or Tony, who's doing the dismissing? Okay, you guys are. All right, good deal. Uh, as soon as Brother DeOily says amen, a few men would start uh, dismissing folks. We'll start from there and work our way over this way. Brother DeOily, if you would, please. Dear Lord, we thank you once again. Lord.